All right. Shabbat Shalom, family. Let us salute. Yahweh Bahashem, Yahweh Shai Barakatham. The Most High, in the name of Christ, bless you. Let us bless them. Ya Baraka Yahawa, Waya Shamarka, Ya Ar Yahawa, Panyawa Aliyaka Waya Kanka, Ya Sha'a Yahawa, Panyawa Aliyaka Waya Shamlaka, Shalom, Amen. Let's translate that into English. It says, The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Hallelujah. How does this one go? It says, Anaya Ahab Yahawa Wa Ahab Ha Thawara Amen. I love Yahawa and I love the law. Amen. One more, you guys know this one. This this one's like our favorite song now. Come on. Shema Yasharala Yahawa Allahayanawa Yahawa Achad Bahasham Yahawa Shai Thawara Aman. It's Deuteronomy chapter six, verse four. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord in the name of Yahweh Shai. Thank you. Amen. Show them what we're talking about tonight. What does it say? He was hung on a what? Why does it say? He was hung on a tree. Examining the crucifixion of the Messiah. We got to get deep today. Because you know some people think it's what? They think it's good Friday. You know what it really is? It's fake Friday. Fake Friday. Okay. First thing I want to point out is. If the person that you loved and the person who loved you got beaten to death, slaughtered and killed, why would you call it a good day? That word Good Friday, that does not appear anywhere in any scriptures. It does not tell you that it is Good Friday. This is a concept that the Catholics created. It is not Good Friday. That is a lie. What makes that a lie? Did he die on a Friday? Nope, he didn't die on a Friday because there's not three days and three nights from Friday to Sunday. So guess what Resurrection Sunday is? That's a lie too. That's a lie. So we're going to be exposing some of these lies today. Amen. And the reason why this message is called he was hung on a tree is because what do people think he was hung on? They think he was hung on a cross. We're going to get into that part because we're going we're gonna to look at these scriptures precept upon precept. Line upon line, here a little and there a little. Now, because Sunday is not Resurrection Sunday, because he didn't rise on a Sunday and there's no such thing, we're going to examine the crucifixion of the Messiah, but we're going to do it through pictures. Remember how I tell you there's a picture of everything in the scriptures? There's a picture to match with all of the teachings. This is going to be a two-part message. Tonight, we're going to examine the overview and then tomorrow we're going to prove what day he was crucified on and what day he resurrected on beyond a, beyond a shadow of a doubt so that everybody can stop being caught up in this false holiday show them the first picture i have 12 pictures that we're going to use to tell the story this works really good for children because what is that a picture of on the screen that's a palm branch what does the palm branch have to do with the messiah Give me John chapter 12, verse 12. Bring the beat down in the background just a little bit. It says, on the next day, much people that were come to the feast. What feast were they coming to? Think, now, think about this. This is almost like a trick question. It's not. But remember, I told you one of these things is not a feast. It's just a meal. Okay, so Passover is not a feast. It's a meal. What do we eat? Unleavened bread, wine, bitter herbs. And before the Messiah died for our sins, we used to eat lamb. We don't eat lamb no more because the lamb no longer represents his body. The bread does. And we're going to take a look at that. Okay, so this whole thing is a big picture. Now, what says on the next day, much people that were come to the feast, the feast is the feast of unleavened bread. That's what they're there for. It says when they heard that Yahweh was coming to Jerusalem, 
Give me verse 13. Look at what they did. It says, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of Adonai. When they said Hosanna, that's what Hosanna means. There's no O in ancient Hebrew, so it's actually pronounced ha sana ha sana Blessed is he that cometh in, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the king, basically. Now watch this. Give me verse 14. It says, and Yahweh Shai, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written. What does that mean? We about to pull out a precept. There's a reason why he found a young donkey. Give me verse 15 and let's find out what's written. The scripture says, fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, thy king cometh sitting on an ass's colt. Okay, how many beasts are in that line? This is important. We have an ass and we have a colt. How many? There's two. Okay, that's very important. Why? Because this is the fulfillment of a prophecy. Give me Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. You're going to see through these pictures that everything that happened to him all the way up to the crucifixion and him being hung on a tree was all foretold in prophecy throughout the scriptures. None of these details is like, oh, let's just throw that in there. Every single one was the fulfillment of a prophecy. Now watch, this is Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. It says, Regrace jointly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation. Lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. When he rode in, there were two beasts. He had both an ass and he had a colt or a foal. Okay, now watch this. Why is that important that so let me let me explain the people who laid down the palm branches as he was coming. They believed they believed that he was the Messiah. When you believe you should do something. You're not going to be like, yeah, I believe that the Messiah is coming to die for my sins next Wednesday, but I'm going to kick it here and just scroll on my Instagram. No, you're going to do something because you believe and they did what the scriptures said they should do. Let's take a look at the prophecy concerning this. Give me Genesis chapter 49, verse 1. And here we're going to learn some very inter interesting information about the Messiah. Okay. Genesis chapter 49. Give me verse 1. Did I put verse 1 in there? I'm going to take that verse 9 after, but let me get verse 1. Okay. It says, and Jacob called unto his sons. How many sons he got? He got 12. Jacob. He's the patriarch of the 12 tribes of Israel. He's got 12 sons and said, gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you. Look at what it says next week, next month. It says in the last days, what time are we living in? We're living in the last days. So he gathered all of his sons together and he said, let me tell you what's going to happen at a time when you're not even going to be alive. Okay. Jump down to verse nine. Now he begins to give a prophecy of all of his sons, according to their name and their tribe. We're going to stick specifically with Judah because he says, Judah is a lion's whelp. What is a whelp? What is it? Cub. It's a young lion. Somebody over here was about to go whelp. I don't know. <laughs> I thought it was going to be you, Mark, but it wasn't you. Look, Judah is a lion's whelp. That means it says from the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He's not chasing after the prey anymore. He stooped down, he couched as a lion and as an old lion, who shall raise him up, rouse him up. What does that mean? That's a picture. Judah is lazy. Judah, does a lion, does the male lion chase after his own food? No, he sent a female lion out there to handle the business. He's sleeping. He's couching. She says, it's time to eat. And he says, oh, okay, let me get over here. <laughs> Let me get he Judah is so lazy. How, ask me how I know. <laughs> Why y'all laughing? Because I'm from the tribe of Judah. I know about that laziness. You guys already know. But watch this. It's talking about the descendant that is going to come out of the tribe of Judah. And that descendant is the Messiah. Now look at verse 10. It says, The scepter. What's a scepter? 
I'm not a sword. It's a rod. It's a rod of correction. It represents authority and rulership. It says the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. Who's Shiloh? Shiloh is Yahweh Shai. That is the Messiah. And unto him, unto who? The Messiah, Shiloh, shall the gathering of the people be. Who's going to gather us out of this captivity back into the land of Israel? Yeah, how is is going to gather us? Okay, now watch. Let's find out a little bitty piece of this prophecy. Give me verse 11. Some people were reading verse 11, and what did they get, Tom? Confused. They got confused. I don't know where Tom is at, but you guys had his back. Look, it says, it says, binding his foal unto the vine and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. This prophecy is written in Genesis and it was fulfilled the day that Yahweh Shai rode into Jerusalem. It says he washed his garments in wine. I'd have to get super deep. I'd have to take y'all into Isaiah 63. When you have time, read Isaiah 63 from the top and you'll see the reason why it says his garments are washed in wine. It says and his clothes in the blood of grapes. For that line, you'd have to know what it says in Revelation because he comes with a white garment and the white garment turns what color? Red, because it's all spotted with blood. That is the prophecy that is being spoken of here. Give me verse 12, though. Let's make sure this guy is from Judah. It says his eyes shall be red with wine. Does that sound like the Messiah? No, it doesn't. No, you're going to have to read a little bit more. His, his eyes were red with wine. Exactly the way the scripture said. What did he drink? He drank wine. He drank wine so much that he had a reputation around J Jerusalem. You guys know that, right? They said, behold, a man gluttonous and a wine bibber. That's how much wine he drank. They called him a fat wino. That's what that means. Gluttonous is you. Okay, watch. And his teeth white with milk. What's that milk? That's the sincere milk of the word. Yeah, the scripture says the milk is the commandments. You need to get pulled off of that milk and get into them to that meat, them prophecies. Okay, so we see the entire prophecy laid out on why they laid down the palms and he came riding in on a nasty's colt. Does that make sense? Show him another slide real quick. Slide number two. What is that? That's a bag. That's a bag. When people talk about trying to get a bag, they're trying to get a bag of silver. Who had that bag of silver? Judas. Judas did. The Messiah was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Why 30? Did they just randomly pick that number or was it prophesied that it had to be 30? It could not be 31 pieces. Now, we're not going to get super detailed because we'll be here all night. But give me Matthew 26 verse 14. The scripture says, then one of the 12 called Judas Iscariot went unto the chief priests, verse 15, and said unto them, what will you, what will ye give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they look at that word and they covenanted. What does that word mean? They agreed. There's no testament in there. It doesn't say they testamented. They covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. Give me verse 16. The scripture says, and from, give me verse 16. Take me back. Matthew chapter 26, verse 16. It says, and from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. So, you guys, this is happening before the Passover. He already made this agreement for 30 pieces of silver. And now he's just trying to figure out when he can betray the Messiah. You guys want to know why it's 30 pieces of silver? Take me into the Old Testament. Give me Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12. Look at this conversation that's taking place. It says, and I said unto them, if ye think good, give me my price. And if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price, 30 pieces of silver. It was already prophesied how much value they would put on the Messiah. They only valued him at 30 pieces of silver. That's the reason why Judas agreed for 30 pieces of silver. It was already written. You guys have to understand the Messiah. 
uh, does everything that is written about him in this book. No prophecy can be left undone. You also have to do everything that is written about you in this book because it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Amen. Okay, watch this. Go ahead, show him a slide real quick. What's that? That's that wine and that bread. What, what, what day do I eat the wine and the bread on? Passover. Give me Matthew 26. Give me verse 2. Watch this. I, I need to prove to you that he's going to be crucified on the Passover. It says, ye know that after two days is the feast of the Passover and the son of man is betrayed to be crucified. It's two days and he already knows in two days he's going to be killed. Now you got to put yourself in the scenario. You got to be there. You're walking around with him. You're one of his disciples. And all of a sudden he pulls out the craziest thing you ever heard. He says, in two days, they're going to kill me. <laughs> well, how do you feel? You're like, wait, I haven't learned enough. Teach me some more. I, there's so much more than I... You playing, they're not going to kill you. You're the savior of Israel. All these different things are going through your mind because you're not entirely sure about the seed principle. You don't know that the seed has to be buried in order for something to rise out of that seed. So a lot of them, they were probably starting to think, well, what can we do? Like Peter, Peter was like, let me get a sword. If they come in after you, Yahweh Shai, I'm going to have me a sword and I'm going to have it ready. He said, after two days, I'm going to be crucified. So it was not a surprise to him what was going to happen. Jump to verse 26. Everybody is sitting at the table and it's time for dinner. It says, and as they were eating, Yahweh Shai took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body. What's his body? Now you need to see that. Prior to his coming physically, his body was the lamb. He is the lamb of God. Isn't that what John the Baptist said? Behold, the lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He right here, he is transmuting. He's showing you that your body, your flesh must be changed into something else because he's made of flesh and the lamb is made of flesh. He's going to be converted into bread, not just any old bread, but unleavened bread. What does leaven represent? Sin, hypocrisy, and false doctrine. He is the bread of life that came down from heaven. He is showing you a picture that you must change. He says, take, eat. This is my body. This is the reason why we don't eat lamb on the Passover. One, Walmart don't have no he lamb of the first year without spot or blemish. And I don't have one growing in my backyard. So I can't find a lamb that's going to fulfill the prophecy, fulfill the requirements of the Passover. I just can't. Plus, in order for me to eat that lamb, what do I have to do first? I got to sacrifice that lamb. And if I sacrifice that lamb, it is blasphemy. It's like saying his sacrifice wasn't good enough. I need some other blood to be spilled. So for those that are watching online, people are going to be watching this video later and they're going to be like, what? You don't eat lamb? No, we don't. We eat his body. And that is a picture of you putting him inside of you. You have to be in him and he has to be in you. Okay, so we got the bread. Give me the next verse. Verse 27. Scripture says, and he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying drink ye all of it that means you take a sip and you pass it and you take a sip and you pass it we're all going to drink from this same cup give me verse 28 it says for this is my blood of the new say it loud this is my blood of the new testament which is shed for many for what reason for the remission what does remission mean for the forgiveness, for the going back, for the re is always again, for the turning away of sins. Okay, so his blood was shed for the remission of sins. What did they, here's the interesting thing. When you're reading it in the New Testament and you're looking for pictures at that dinner, there is no lamb. It doesn't tell you that they ate lamb. We know that they did. That's the last time that they ate lamb, but it doesn't say it. Because it's a picture for us that we would no longer be eating lamb. He mentioned exactly two things. Bread and wine. Why? We got to go all the way back to Genesis to find out why he's only talking about the bread and the lamb. Give me Genesis chapter 14. 
verse 18. Anybody ever heard of Melchizedek? He's a special character in the Bible, Melchizedek. Look at what it says on the screen. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, what does Salem mean? It's the same as Shalom. Yeah, S Salem, it's actually Jerusalem, Jerusalem, not Jerusalem. Okay, and Melchizedek, king of peace, brought forth bread and wine. And he was the priest of the Most High Yah. Now, Melchizedek has a priesthood that is not from the Aaronic priesthood. He's not from the Levitical priesthood. He remains a priest forever. So there was a change of the law concerning who could be a priest. So the Levites used to be the priests until Yahweh Shai came because Yahweh Shai is from the tribe of Judah. And Yahweh Shai is our high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Give me verse 19. The scripture says, and he, Melchizedek, blessed him. The him is Abraham. And said, blessed be Abram of the most high Yah, possessor of heaven and earth. Give me verse 20. And blessed be the most high Yah, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he, that's Abraham, gave him, Melchizedek, tithes of all. This is the first time that tithes were ever given in the Bible. They were given by Abraham, who was the patriarch. He's the father of Levi. Levi was giving tithes to Melchizedek, even though Levi would not be born for many centuries. There was already a picture of the changing of the law or the changing of the priesthood in this verse. This is the reason why. So remember, remission, everything is going back to the way that it's supposed to. If we had never sinned, there would be no lamb in any of our sacrifices. It would have just been the bread and the wine. The lamb was an atonement for sins. Does that make sense? Okay. Show them a slide real quick. Picture number four. What is that? That's a cat. Cat. -a. Would you say caterpillar? No, it's not a caterpillar. Would you say it's a cat? That's a cat of nine tails. This is a Roman whip. Okay, what did they do to Yahweh Shai? Give me John chapter 19, verse 1. I want you to picture that you're there and you love this man and they've taken him and they've stripped his clothes off of him and they're beginning to beat him. It says, then Pilate therefore took Yahweh Shai and scourged him. That means he whipped him. Give me verse 2. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns. What does plaited mean? They braided they braided together a crown of thorns, okay? And put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. Let's keep going. Verse 3. We're going to read straight through this part. It says, And said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. What does that mean? They smacked him around. They're beating him, and they're mocking him. Verse 4. Pilate therefore went forth again and said unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. That part is very important. Pilate is what? He's a Roman. Who did he just deliver Yahweh Shai to? The Jews. Those are Israelites, scribes and Pharisees. Okay, now watch this. He says, I have examined him. I even beat the guy. And I st he didn't even cuss me out. I find no fault in him, none at all. Give me verse five. It says, then came Yahweh Shai forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, behold the man, look at him. Give me verse six. When the chief priest, therefore, and officer saw him, they cried out saying, you say it, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Who's responsible for the crucif crucifixion at this point? The Jews are. We are. We are the ones that are responsible because the authority, which was Rome, said, no, he's good. I don't find. I talked to him. He's cool. And we said, no, we want him dead anyway. He said, well, you go and you do it then. Okay, now watch this. What was he wearing at that time? Show him a slide real quick. 
the purple robe and the crown of thorns. What does purple represent? Royalty. And that crown, heavy is the head. It, heavy is the head that wears the crown. Okay, watch this. Give me Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Yeah, I'm sorry. Mark chapter 5, verse 17. Scripture says, and they clothed him with purple and plaited the crown of thorns and put it about his head. Give me verse 18. We're going to run right through this part. And began to salute him. Hail, king of the Jews. And they smote him on the head with a reed and did spit on him. And bowing their knees, worshipped him. Verse 20. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him and put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. They did all of that stuff. Now, we don't have enough time to cover this, but the scripture says they were going to do all of that stuff. He already knew they're going to do all of these things. They literally pulled the hair out of his beard. They, they spit in his face. They, they beat him in the head with the reed like they were smacking him. They were literally beating him. The scripture says he was bruised for what? Our transgressions. But with his stripes, what are we? We are healed with his stripes. Okay, so... Show me this next picture. We're, we're at the halfway mark. What is that a picture of? Why? How come I don't have a picture of a cross? Like two perfectly sanded, like uh, two by fours, like with a black and decker. Because he wasn't hung on that. He was hung on a tree. Did they care about this man? They don't care about this man. Now watch this. Give me John chapter 19, verse 15. I want you to see what it says. It's always said this. It didn't just change because I put this message together. Watch. But they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto him, unto them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. Give me this next verse. Then delivered he that's Pilate, him, that's Yahweh Shai, therefore unto them, that's the Jews. He delivered him to the Jews to be crucified. And they took Yahweh Shai and led him away. Give me verse 17. And he, what is he doing? Bearing his cross. What does that mean? He's, he's going like this, oh, with this big old thing on his back. What is, that? is that what it means? He's not carrying anything. What is he bearing? What does the cross represent in the scriptures? Suffering. He is bearing his suffering. Okay, first of all, what you need to see is that so-called last supper, that was just a few hours ago. He was there with his disciples. He took off his clothes. He washed their feet. They had the dinner. They sang some psalms. They went out to the garden, and that's when he was betrayed. That's when the people came. They had already eaten. And it's like the middle of the night and they come and they, gab, they grab him. And then they take him and they put him inside the prison. He didn't get no sleep. The next day has not come. It's not three days later. It's still the same day. And now he's been beaten. He's been tortured. And now he is bearing his suffering. He's walking. All of this thing took place within a time period of 24 hours. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew, Golgotha, the place of a skull. Who's, whose head is buried there? Goliath's head is buried in Jerusalem. That's why it's called the place of a skull. Okay, anybody ever heard that Simon was carrying his cross? You heard that some before? That's like in the back of your mind. It says he bearing his cross. Nobody carried any cross because he was hung on a tree. Okay, watch this. Give me verse 18. It says, where they crucified him and two other with him. One, I'm sorry, on either side and Yahweh, on either side, one and Yahweh Shai in the mist. Okay, they hung him on a tree. How many witnesses we want to see? How many witnesses does scripture say we need? In the mouth of Two or three, okay? I'd like to call my first witness to the stand. Please give me Acts chapter 5, verse 30. Acts chapter 5, verse 30, the scripture says, The Allah of our fathers raised up Yahweh Shai, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Any questions about that? I'd like to call my second witness to the stand. Give me Acts chapter 10, verse 39. 
and we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem whom they slew and hanged on a tree at this point somebody ought to be thinking about throwing the case out somebody ought to be thinking about throwing away the crosses that they have hanging on the walls or the crucifixes that they wear around their neck because those are graven images and he wasn't hung on that anyway I'd like to call my final witness to the stand. Give me Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. The scripture says, Hamashiach hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written. What does that mean? That means we're going to get into them precepts. That's my fourth witness. Writes this. It says, cursed, it, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Those are three witnesses. They all say that he was hung on a tree. Nobody should be running around here thinking that he was hung on a cross. The scripture does not say that. But it says, for it is written. Let's find out where it's written at. Give me Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 22. And now you're going to see the reason why they had to take him down so quickly after he died. Because that's the law. If the Romans had crucified him and been in control of the whole thing, they don't care. They would have left him hanging there. But the Jews, they said, no, you, you can't. When the sun goes down, he has to come down. And this is the reason why. Deuteronomy 21, 22, it says, and if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, did Yahweh commit a sin worthy of death? Nope. They put him to death wrongfully. It says, and he be to be put to death and thou hang him on a tree. You may not have an option of hanging him on a tree if he's worthy of death. Yeah, the law says so. But there's a statute that goes along with it. Give me verse 23. It says, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is accursed of Yah, that thy land be not defiled, which Yahweh thy Allah giveth thee for an inheritance. What did they do when they hung Yahweh Shai? Remember, they went to the other people next to him and they broke their legs. Boom. Did they break Yahweh Shai's legs? No, because the scripture says you can't break his bones. Can't break none of these prophecies that make up his body. That's what his bones are as far as the scriptures go. You can't break a single one of them. He was, he had already given up the ghost. Ain't that right? And what did they say? Who? The sun is going down. It's about time for us to take him down because he can't be hanging up there because we have only three hours left to prepare for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He was crucified on the Passover at 3 p.m. 3 p.m. We got we got three out. We got three hours left. We got to take him down before the sun goes down and put this bread into the oven. Roll that stone back. You guys are you starting to see the pictures that are taking place? Okay, that's the reason why they had to take him down, because it is the law. Show him this picture right here. I feel like we've been talking about this for a while. What's that a picture of? Shake them. Shake them. Those are bones. Those are dice. What did we just celebrate recently that had to do with dice? Parim. Yeah, pariam. Okay, watch this. Give me Matthew chapter 27, verse 35. Scripture says, and they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. That means that they're about to pull out a precept right here. They, see that capital T? Everybody looking at the screen? It says, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. Whenever something is quoted in the King James Bible, there are no quotation marks. The first word of what that person says, the quote, is always capitalized. So if you're ever reading and in the middle of the sentence, you'll see a word capitalized. It means someone actually spoke that word. It says, they parted my garments among them and upon my vesture did they cast lots. Let's take a look at that. Um, why did they do that? Because every single word has to be fulfilled. Give me Psalms chapter 22 verse 18. This is David speaking, and he knew that this was going to happen to the Messiah. It says, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Do you know that people who don't believe in the Old Testament and don't read the Old Testament, they can't prove nothing. They have no proof for any of the stuff that they believe. 
you have to have the Old Testament because the scripture says, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O Yah. You have to have the volume of the book. Show him another picture real quick. Um, what is this a picture of? It's three different languages. That top one is modern Hebrew. The second one is, I don't know. I think it's, I think it's Greek. Yes, it's Greek. And the third one is Latin. Okay. They wrote this. Watch. Give me uh, Matthew chapter 27, verse 37. It says, and set up over his head this accusation. Okay. This accusation written. What is it called here? It's called, what is it called? It's called an accusation. He's being accused of something. And set up over his head this accusation written. And this is what it says. But look at how it's typed out. This is important because it's being called an accusation. Is it true? No. Okay. You need to, everybody's not going to see what I'm putting together right here. This is Yahweh Shai, the king of the Jews. That part is true. It is Yahweh Shai, and he is the king of the Jews, but they're using it as an accusation. Accusation can also be one of these things. Go to Luke chapter 23, verse 38. Look at what it says here. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. A bunch of things just happened. You might not have been aware of them. One, you just found the Bible giving you a definition of superscript. Remember whenever we see Yahweh's name in all capital letters, what's it called? It's called a superscription. And what did they do? They showed you a superscription has to be in all capital letters. But a superscription is also an accusation. Because whenever we see Yahweh, whenever we see Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, and capital D, what used to be there was his name. What they put there now is Baal's name. It's an accusation. The superscript demonstrates the accusation. Some of y'all got it. Some of y'all got it. Okay, good, good. That's deep. That's deep right there. Show them another picture. You guys will recognize this thing. What is, th what is that? That's a spear. Okay, because he's already crucified right now. What, what did they do with this? This, this is the tip of the spear. They pierced this side. Give me John 1934. The scripture says, but one of the soldiers. So what nationality is he if, he, if he's one of the soldiers? He's a Roman, but one of the soldiers with the spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. Blood and water. Imagine you're there. This is a, you're like, what'd you say? It's a, it's a symbolism of the baptism because he was already dead. Watch this. Here's the reason why blood and water came out. First John chapter five, verse six. This is he that came by water and blood. Even Yahweh Shai Hamashiach, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit that beareth witness because the spirit is truth. Give me this next verse. This verse that I'm about to show you, if you're not reading in your King James Bible, you're reading a different version of the Bible, they're going to take verse 7 and verse 8, and they're going to put the two of the verses together. So it doesn't even say this in counterfeit versions. But here it says, for there are how many? Three that bear, what do they bear? Record in heaven. Who are they? The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are what? One. Give me verse 8. Okay, so that's our authority up there. That's the ruling powers. And it says, and there are three that bear, what do they bear? Witness. So this blood in this water is a witness for us in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood. That's why the water and the blood had to come out of him because you can only get out of you what's already inside of you. As every time he spoke, the spirit came out of him. What did he say? The flesh profiteth nothing. Right? The words that I speak unto you, what are they? Spirit and life. And when they pierced his side, the water came out and the blood came out. It says, and these three agree in one. Yahweh Shai is the one that these three agree in. Amen? 
Show them another picture real quick. We're at number 10 and we only got 12. What is that a picture of? What's that on that side? Spices? That's looking real spicy. Okay, what's this? Uh, the tomb. He's inside the tomb. Okay. The cloth and the spices. The cloth and the spices. Give me John chapter 19, verse 39. Now watch this. Everything in the Bible is connected. You just got to figure out how it's connected. Don't close it until you figure out the connection. And there came also Nicodemus. And there's a pause right there. It's pausing so that you can say, what do you remember about Nicodemus? Why does that name stand out? What do you remember? What did he do? He came to Yahweh by night. He's the guy who asked the question about being reborn, who thought that he need to go back into his mother's womb. Okay, now watch it says, and there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Yahweh Shai by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes. What are those? Spices, Spices. about a hundred pound weight. That's expensive. That's a lot. Okay, uh, give me verse 40. What is he doing with this? It says, then took they the body of Yahweh Shai and wound it in linen clothes. Why? Because Yahweh Shai is the man in the linen garments. Whether he's alive or he's dead, he's the man in the linen garments. It says, wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Why was it Nicodemus that came? Because Nicodemus, what is he? He's a Pharisee, but he's a Pharisee who believes. Right? Watch this. Watch what he said because he's already made his confession that he believes that Yahweh Shai is the Messiah. Give me John chapter 3, verse 1. Scripture says, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Give me the next verse. The same came to Yahweh Shai by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from Yah. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except Yah be with him. So he's already made his confession. I believe that you are the Messiah. I snuck over here in the middle of the night to ask you a very important question. And later, when he was crucified, Nicodemus showed up. Because the question that Nicodemus really wants to know is about resurrection. You guys remember that, right? So he's preparing Shai's body for what he believes is going to happen. He believes Shai is going to rise from the dead. And he's like, and when you wake up from the dead, you need to smell fresh. Because, you know, you've been dead for a few days. He stinketh already. So he was preparing his body. He believed oh, he's going to rise from the dead. I had a conversation with him just a few nights ago. I'm expecting to see him again. So I'm going to roll up with this frankincense and these aloes. And he's going to rise and be smelling real sweet. Okay. Show him another picture real quick. What is this a picture of? Was, was he buried? He didn't, he didn't actually go in the dirt. So why do people say that the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection? He didn't actually go in no dirt. The gospel is the life, the death, and the resurrection. His life was an example for me. His death is what gave me forgiveness of sins, but his resurrection is what gets me into the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Matthew 27, 59. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth. Now that you know that, and you just read the verse about Nicodemus, you can clearly see that they're in cahoots. They're doing this together, aren't they? Watch this. Give me the next verse. It says, and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. Verse 61. And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. Verse 62. Now the next day that followed the day of the preparation, that line right there is part of the uproar. See, because at this time, two things are happening. We're preparing for the feast of unleavened bread. But if this was a Friday, what would we be preparing for? 
the Sabbath. So if you're not following the feast days and following the story and reading it precept upon precept, you might think that it's Friday, except for the fact that it says now the next day. Does that make sense? So it can't be Friday, can it? It's the next day. It says the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate. Give me verse 63 saying, look at what they're saying, sir. We remember that that deceiver said while he was yet alive after three days, I will rise again. See what it says on the screen. That's a lie. He never said that. Did he? That's not what he said. You got to remember when a liar is speaking, it's all lies that come out of their mouth. He did not say after three days, I will rise again. This is the reason why it's very important for you to know the word, word for word. What did he say? I, I will rise it up again in three days. Okay. Not after three days, after three days, 14 days is after three days, five, four, any amount. He said in three days, let me show you exactly what he said. And you're going to see how important this is in relation to what people are going to be doing on Sunday. Because he said, I'm only going to give one sign, just one sign. If you see any other sign, you are worshiping a false God. Watch this. If it's not this sign, it's a false God. Give me Matthew chapter 12, verse 39. It says, but he answered and said unto him, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign and there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. What's the only sign that we're going to have that he is the Messiah? It's the same sign as the prophet Jonas. That's what he just said. Okay. Well, what is that sign? I don't remember the story of Jonah that well. Jonas, is he, that one of the brothers? I don't even know what this is talking about, right? Some of y'all was thinking that. You was like, okay, watch. Give me verse 40. He says, for as Jonah... Jonas was three days and three nights in the well's belly. So shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That part is absolutely crucial because if the, the Messiah that you're worshiping rose in a day and a half, if he was in there on Friday and he woke up on a Sunday, he's fake. This is the only sign. This is how we know the real versus the fake. He needed to be in there for three days and three nights, not after, not a day and a half, exactly as he said it. Does that make sense? Okay. You're going to have to tell somebody who's celebrating Easter. Just tell them, count it with me, count it with me. And if it don't add up, don't do it. <laughs> if it don't add up, it's counterfeit. That's good. I like that. Let's go back. Matthew 27, 64. I'm in wrap up mode. Matthew 24, 27, 64. It says, command there, command therefore that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, he is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. That line they just admitted that they knew they made an error. The last hour error that we made would be worse than the first error that we made. They knew killing him was an error. Okay. Show them this last slide real quick. What is that slide? Nope. It's empty. It's empty. Because when they went to the tomb, that's why there's nothing on that slide. There was nothing in the tomb either. Amen. Watch this. Give me Mark chapter 16, verse one. It says, when the Sabbath was passed, <sighs> see that comma? It probably should have been a semicolon the way that people be reading this. When the Sabbath was passed, somebody tell me when the Sabbath is passed, what time is it? Roughly what time is it or what part of the day is it? And what does it look like outside? It is dark. It could be six. It could be six thirty. It could be seven o'clock. What is the modern day day called? Saturday. It's when the sun goes down on Saturday. Isn't that right? Okay. There's a reason why it's telling you this. It says when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, 
and Salome, whose name is also Mary, the three Marys, had bought sweet spices. Why does it say that they bought sweet spices? Because the Sabbath is over. You see that? They're at home resting on the Sabbath because what can I not do on the Sabbath? Okay, so the Sabbath is over. They go out. They buy sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. Give me this next verse. And very early in the morning, very early in the morning, the first day of the week, what day is it? Sunday. It's Sunday now. Okay, we can clearly see it's the first day of the week and it's very early in the morning. They came unto the sepulcher. When? At the, why does it give you all those details? So that you will not be deceived and be like, yeah, it's the first thing in the morning. And here he is. He's brushing his teeth in there. He's putting on his socks. He was already gone. Ain't that right? The Sabbath is over. When Sunday started, he was already gone. He wasn't getting up. He was gone. What does that mean? He rose on the Sabbath. Okay, it says, and very early in the morning. The first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. Verse 3. And they said among themselves, Who shall roll away, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? Verse 4. And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. How did that stone get rolled away? No, no. I, I, I asked that because I knew some of y'all was going to think that he was on the back side of it and he went up to the door and he's like, no, he didn't have to do that. Angels came down and rolled the stone away from him for him. Give me verse five. It says, and entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment. And they were affrighted. It says it's a young man. What is it actually? It's an angel. It's an angel sitting there and he's going to deliver a message to them. Give me the next verse. This is my last verse. Verse six. It says, and he saith unto them, be not affrighted. Ye seek Yahweh Shai of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. That's very important. Does it say he is rising? When the first thing, first light of the morning. Oh, yeah, he's back there. He's putting on his shoes. He'll be out in a couple minutes. Go ahead and chase some eggs. Get some eggs. See that bunny over there? He's got some chocolate. It doesn't say none of that, does it? It doesn't say none of that. It says he is risen. It already happened. He is not here. Wait a minute. It's the first light in the morning and he's already gone. Why would anyone think that he rose on a Sunday if he's already gone? The scripture says, behold, the place where they laid him. Amen. OK, we have covered the entire story of the crucifixion tomorrow. Uh, Yah willing, we're going to get into deeper detail about the resurrection timeline, proving up to the hour exactly how long he was in the grave, what time it happened and what time he resurrected. So hopefully you will join us for that tomorrow. This is the message that I have for you. <laughs> Hallelujah.